AMD just announced its pricing and release date for the X3D CPUs. So we just published a hardware news video. There's already a lot more news. And also we published an Intel Arc driver updates news video because those were pretty massive too, where Intel's claiming 10 to 77% uplift. But check that video for that information. So in this one, we'll be talking about the X3D pricing, the release date. We're also going to go over Intel's financials being way down, uh, fraudulent remanufactured video cards, and rumors of a Titan card from NVIDIA. Before that, this video is brought to you by Squarespace. We use Squarespace for our own GN store and juggle complex multi-piece orders all the time with it. Squarespace makes it fast for us to roll out new products with detailed pages full of galleries, videos, and descriptors. It's also useful for your own resume sites, for photographer or project portfolios, or for starting your new small business idea. There's never been a better time to try and start your new business than right now. And we can vouch that Squarespace makes it easy. Visit squarespace.com slash gamersnexus to get 10% off your first purchase with Squarespace. AMD, the 7950X3D, 7900X3D, and 7800X3D were all previously announced. So that information is known. We'll put a spec table on the screen. If you need to catch up on what it was, get a refresher. But otherwise, you can check our previous news video to get the full details. Either way, those are the specs that you see on the screen. Now, pricing has been officialized at this point. So Andy just told us today that the 7950X3D, the highest end one, is going to sell for $700. The 7900X3D, which is a 12 core, that will sell for $600. And then the 7800X3D, which is the lowest end of the X3Ds, will be $450. The release date, is, there's two of them. So February 28th is the release date on shelf. That's the date you can buy it, not necessarily the reviews date. That will be for the 7950X3D and the 7900X3D. So February 28th for that, and we'll have reviews. And then the 7800X3D launches on April 6th, so pretty far in the future. I'm sure we'll have a review of it, but it's too far out for right now. So that's the release date and the pricing. Now for comparison, the 7950X non-3D, the original 16 core for this generation, that launched with a price uh, uh, it was closer to like $750, most of the retail, like actual availability. And now it's about $600 on B&H Photo, a new egg from a quick check. We saw 7900X is anywhere from $420, $450 or so on retailers. And uh, that establishes at least a $100 price gap for the 7950X and X3D. Whether or not that's worth it, I mean, the 100 bucks could easily be very worth it. It could also easily be very not worth it. So we'll test it. We'll let you know once we have the parts in. But at least there's some flex in the pricing. The next story is related, but uh, this is about the 7000 X3D information that was in flux. Mostly AMD's fault here, not like rumor stuff, but AMD put some stuff out, then they retracted it. So just to recap, you may have seen a February 14th release date for the X3Ds originally. That date was incorrect. That wasn't a rumor. That was AMD that was the source of that. So AMD put out this statement. They said, as you know, today AMD.com briefly published a launch date for the Ryzen 7000 X3D series desktop processors. However, that date is incorrect. We have not confirmed a launch date at this time. This was posted like a week ago. We will provide updates on the expected availability of these processors at a future date. And again, now they've provided it. So you have those. That was, it was an annoying mistake for AMD, I'm sure, but uh, not a big deal overall. More recently, there was another error that we noticed where AMD published a, uh, a page that 9550 Pro on Twitter caught where they said the, the new 7000 X3D processors will be unlocked for overclocking. And then that page disappeared in less than 12 hours. So uh, we called AMD and we asked about this detail. AMD provided this quote about this error. Ryzen 7000 X3D processors are unlocked for memory and infinity fabric overclocking, just like Ryzen 5800 X3D. New to the 7000 X3D, we have also added PBO and Curve Optimizer capabilities. To just be abundantly clear for them on their phrasing here, uh, that means new to the 7000 X3D as opposed to the 5800 X3D, but not new to the 7000 series. You can already do that on the 7000 series processors. So we asked Andy for some more detail. They elaborated that individual voltage control, so vCore and multiplier control, will not be available to you for the X3D processors, only PBO and, uh, and the other things they discussed, and IF and, and Curve Optimizer. So that's it. We're not really sure what was going on with AMD in the last month relating to these CPUs, 
But it's all cleared up now. So next story, Intel financials way down. Following up Intel's good news about the ARC driver improvements, that again is a separate video if you want to catch up on that. They also had news of a really bad fourth quarter for 2022. And we don't typically cover industry financials. We do when it's more interesting or relevant to our audience. Uh, this is definitely one of the times it's worth covering because it was a bloodbath for Intel. So Intel's overall fourth quarter 2022 revenue was $14 billion. It's down 28% year over year. And just the, uh, the quick existential reminder here, $14 billion, still an unfathomable number. So certainly a little bit of boo-hoo. It's not 15 or $16 billion, but it's a pretty big change for Intel. A 28% is a massive drop, especially for a company that has as many employees as Intel does, where compared to NVIDIA, for example, Intel's employee count is just through the roof. Uh, and uh, there's, there's some inefficiency baked into Intel's processes. Anyway, gross margin was 44%. So that's down 12 percentage points year over year. All this is official information from Intel. Earnings per share was 10 cents or down 92-ish percent year over year. And overall, Intel lost $664 million for the quarter. Now, even though $664 million is a large number, that's actually not catastrophic for Intel as a whole, but certain specific business units took the brunt of this blow. Like AMD and Nvidia and everyone else, Intel divvies its different groups of technologies and segments into different categories when it reports financials. So uh, the client computing group represents desktops, laptops, most of the stuff our audience would interact with, uh, consumer products basically, that took a massive hit. Revenue there was down 36%. Uh, profit operating income was down 82%. <laughs> Yikes, $700 million. So margin was 11%. This is definitely filed under the category of everybody saw that coming, including Intel. Uh, I mean, you ride high for years on insane demand for work from home and everybody suddenly needs computers to work in different locations. Not a surprise that it all comes crashing down because it's not even a difference of like, it, it's the delta that's the problem, right? Where it skyrockets so high and then it falls below the original baseline. So now the fall looks precipitous and much worse than realistically, uh, if you kind of average two numbers, it might not look quite as bad, but that's not the way the economy works or companies of valuation as high as Intel's. So this is a big deal, of course, but again, not a surprise. The server market is another interesting point though. This one saw a similar result. Intel's data center and AI group was down 33% on revenue year over year. Operating income was also down by 84% to $400 million. This resulted in a margin of only 9%. So Intel places partial blame for this on a smaller total addressable market or what the business types like to call TAM. And as someone who's been to a lot of press events over the years, uh, that is one of the, the phrases I've picked up. TAM is something that people who wear suits care deeply about. So now I use that word and it makes it sound like I'm relatable to them. So anyway, there was also competitive pressure from AMD, which is something I understand a little bit better. So AMD and other companies are pressuring Intel. There's reduced demand, of course. And Intel says it will now focus on increasing the unit cost of next generation server products. So if fewer are being sold, uh, they're just going to charge more for what's going out the door. Intel covered some other segments as well. The most interesting is graphics or AXG, which includes products like Arc. Revenue here was flat. It managed to gain 1% year over year. Operating income has actually been a loss for AXG so far. This really shouldn't be a surprise. It's new. They have to put money in. You got to lose some at the beginning. But Intel has only lost $441 million for the past year. Well, actually in quarter four, sorry. Uh, of 2022 versus 641 million for the year before for, for ARC for the prior year. So uh, that is looking better. They're chipping ARC now. They're starting to reclaim some money. Some of the sunk cost is getting kind of reconciled or nullified. Um, we're, we're a little, so I'm a little bit worried about these numbers for this particular unit uh, because this is one that we really want to see succeed. And like we said when we reviewed ARC, like it's not up to you as consumers to kickstart a multi-billion dollar international corporation's new product line. 
So it's not up to consumers. It's not consumers' fault if Intel kills this and rug pulls Arc and walks away from it all. Uh, and don't let anyone shame you for boohoo. Consumers didn't buy it. That's why it failed. So now consumers have failed themselves because NVIDIA and AMD have no competition. That's not what this is. But Arc is starting to improve in serious ways. The drivers that released just today show that. That's a massive increase in performance and very promising. There's a ton of room where Intel can gain ground in performance without even changing the hardware. That's the best type of performance uplift because it doesn't really cost anything other than development time. It doesn't cost the 18 months or whatever it is to really re-engineer a refresh for silicon. So that's good. What we're concerned about, what I'm concerned about, is if the suits at Intel uh, or its investors see these numbers, shareholders, and they go, "What? What are we? Why did we? Why are we losing billions of dollars over years on this thing? This doesn't make any sense." Uh, because this is a longer-term play. Now, hopefully, Intel has done well enough to communicate that to the shareholders, and the shareholders aren't vultures enough to kill something before, in this instance, it really has a chance to shine. Because it's it's starting to get there. There's a real chance for Arc. Anyway. The, the losses are down, so that's good at least. Looking forward, Intel confirmed that it's on track for new desktop CPUs. It noted specifically Meteor Lake. It's the second half of 2023, so that's coming out this year. They also have something called Lunar Lake coming out in 2024 sometime. And then Sapphire Rapids workstation CPUs are actually starting to ship and get moving, and they'll be launching officially in February. Now, Intel didn't mention anything about a rumored Raptor Lake CPU or Alchemist GPU refresh. So we're not going to hold our breath for those, but uh, those have also been kind of talked about in the rumor mill lately. Up next, fraudulent remanufactured video cards. The shortest possible version of this story is be careful when you buy new video cards right now because some of them are being kind of repackaged and Frankensteined into uh, what is billed as a new card when in fact it's multiple parts from old dead mining cards turned into a definitely not new video card. So after the crash of cryptocurrency mining, obviously lots of cards ended up on the used market. Um, they've been sitting there for quite a while. And now it seems like some of them are going to the new market instead. Maybe it was, they were like, hey, when we put the used car on our used car lot, it's not selling. What if we change it and we write new on the windshield and uh, we'll put some new tires on it? Problem solved. Someone else's problem. So YouTube channels Iskandar Souza and Tech Lab have both been doing some digging into suspect cards being sold as new sealed units on marketplaces like AliExpress. However, what they're uncovering is that in reality, the cards are either just repacked used units or the Frankenstein monsters that are composed of bits of several dead ones. In the Tech Lab video, they unbox what is called an AFOX, Affix, whatever, RX 580 eight gigabyte card. It's supposed to be new and it has all the markings, packaging, and even the seals that one would expect. After they take the cooler off of the board, the group reveals a GPU package with a discolored, almost burnt looking substrate. Ultimately, Tech Lab shows three cards like this and compares them to a known good model from Sapphire and the difference in color is evident. Moving on to Iskandar Souza, he shares footage from an electronics repair specialist who goes into more detail about what he believes is happening with cards like this. He shows several examples of thoroughly used GPU substrates and memory packages, comparing ones with and without discoloration on the green PCB on the epoxy. And these are both really cool investigation videos where they start looking into stuff. It's, I mean, it's, I love seeing stuff like this. This is the type of work I like doing and to see what they're putting into it, it's, it's pretty cool. So uh, super worth watching. Check out Tech Lab and Iskandar Souza. We will print the names on the screen or show the channels. And, uh, and link them for you. So anyway, they go on to explain a couple ways that the memory can end up being discolored. One of them is from extended use in heat and GPU mining. Uh, they talk about some other ways as well. I'm not going to go through them all because I'd rather you watch his video, but they, there's a couple different uh, ways you can identify how a package may have been used in the past, and that's what they talk about. The repair technician also shows off an RX 550. It didn't have any signs of hard use, but after heating the memory with a hot air tool, he was actually able to t scrape off a top layer of printing to reveal the original underside. So in this instance, what they're doing is revealing that the uh, repackaging factory is painting over evidence of prior use. And there's a lot of this, they go into more detail. 
Um, but it's pretty crazy how it works. So uh, eventually the cards end up getting just dissected, reassembled into something else, and sold as new. Now, some opinions here. On one hand, it is awesome to get reuse out of something that is otherwise just e-waste because the previous owner thought it's not worth selling this and collecting pennies on the dollar for what I paid. I'm just going to get rid of it. So it's cool to see that salvaged. What's not cool is uh, lying about it. So if it's sold as used and everyone's clear, that's fine. But when you piecemeal together something that is not actually what it's advertised as, that's the problem. So there's nothing wrong with the practice of transplanting parts from one board to another. It's actually awesome if it is done transparently and ethically. But anyway, uh, if you are buying cards online, especially from third-party marketplace sellers, then at this point you need to not only be wary of used cards, but also or maybe especially of new cards, particularly if they're from brands you've never heard of. So that's what you need to know on the consumer side. Just be careful what you're buying right now for GPUs. All right, Noctua has a new cooler out. This is an AM5 low profile cooler. And uh, this is the L9A low profile cooler. It's specifically for use on Ryzen 7000 CPUs. The L9A has already existed for other sockets, but this one comes out of the box for use on AM5. The whole thing's pretty tiny for a cooler. It's only 37 millimeters tall with one of Noctua's fans installed. It's an NFA9 by 14 and that's a 90 millimeter fan. All of its dimensions fit within AMD's socket keep out zone, and that ensures access to memory, fan headers, and whatever other connections you might have near the socket, especially on SFF configurations. Noctua intends this cooler to be used in small form factor builds and with AMD's 65 watt TDP non-X CPUs, but it claims it's been used internally for the higher wattage parts as well. So we're fairly certain the quiet part wouldn't apply in those situations. The wattage is going up enough, the fan's gonna have to run louder. But the NHL9A AM5 is available now in Noctua's uh, brown and beige color, 45 bucks. And they also have an all black Chromax for 55. So next one, the GPU rumor mill is spinning about as fast as it can with the newest rumor being of an Ada Titan, an Nvidia Ada Lovelace Titan GPU. So. The last time we saw the name Titan in any official capacity was the Titan RTX. That was 2018 at this point. And the newest rumor is from a Twitter user named Mega Size GPU. It's an appropriate name. So this it's an I.O. plate, but it's weird because it's four slots wide with a huge hole in the middle. The second photo, as it was leaked, assuming these are legitimate, shows the card with a, a very 40 series-esque outer frame, and it has a champagne gold color on a clearly gigantic four slot card. Now for you all, for an inside look into our process, when uh, Jeremy was writing this news story, when he brought it to me and asked about it, I, I basically said, we're not covering that when we first looked at it together because I looked at the photo of the card and I was like, no way. Like this is too comically large. It seems fabricated. So the only reason we came back to it and we we're like, well, it's, it's covered. It seems like it's worth covering is because it actually kind of correlates with a previous leak that we also elected to skip actually uh, about a GPU that was photographed and it looked like it was some rooftop AC unit because it was so huge. So the most unusual thing we can see here is the way the I.O. ports are stacked rather than side by side. This could just be NVIDIA trying a new I.O. layout to possibly save PCB space. It could be fake. Uh, it could also be a stranger theory, which maybe the PCB is rotated 90 degrees, lying parallel to the motherboard rather than perpendicular like normal. Now this particular layout would corroborate an earlier leak of a very strange NVIDIA looking cooler. Again, we chose to skip that one months ago because, I mean, I frankly, I looked at it and I thought it didn't look real, but with this leak, it makes more sense. So this cooler has several design features that really scream Founders Edition, like the fan mount in the upper left and the X uh, or X frame style in the top for the hourglass frame. Another difference versus the 4090FE's cooler is that the fins are all straight rather than chevron. Facing the camera is the cold plate, but it's on the wrong side of the cooler as compared to traditional designs. There are clearly areas for contact with GDDR memory on three sides of the GPU die, power stages, and other components as well. 
A final complication is that if the main PCB is relocated like we're talking about here, you would still have to get it into the PCIe slot somehow. The only way we can think of is to have a smaller board soldered on at a 90 degree angle or doing a bend, I guess, in the PCB so that it can still plug in normally. And that's why initially when we were looking at this, we thought against covering it because it just seems like an insane amount of gymnastics to jump through to come to a conclusion of why would a card that traditionally sockets like this suddenly be basically oriented this way except the PCIe slot is still here. Uh, but again, as we started piecing it together, we're like, oh, maybe this makes sense. So we're basically just talking about this for fun at this point. We'll see where it goes. Um, if this were a real design, though, the obvious question of why would you design a card that way for a Titan, I, we kind of came to two conclusions. So one of them was thermal. The other one was GPU sag, where if you move the card to more or less be like that, you have now effectively eliminated the concern of GPU sag insofar as the cooler pulling away from the PCB. We've had this happen internally. We have enough video cards and enough systems here where uh, some of them have needed maintenance over time because the cooler actually does depart from the MOSFETs, the inductors, stuff like that, and you have to tighten it down every now and then if it's not well designed. So this orientation avoids that. Uh, it perhaps introduces new issues, but you would avoid GPU sag. The other upside of doing something like this, especially if it's four slots deep, is that now you get a complete flow through design. All of the air can go through the whole cooler and you don't have sort of this one fan over here on the GPU side that hits a wall and can't flow it completely through. And conversely, a potential downside of this is that if the PCB is oriented this way, you potentially, I can't figure out another phrasing, form a hot pocket behind, I'll, I'll take my money now, thank you. You form a hot pocket behind the video card and against the motherboard where that area is typically kind of airflow starved anyway and uh, lots of boards put M.2 slots right there. So maybe that's a downside. One last bit of information that gives us some credibility though is uh, an import entry from Volta that contains several references to 699-1G137 graphics cards being shipped to India for development and testing purposes. And that was the entry that made us go, okay, let's cover it. So for this, that code matches the markings on the IO plate of the card that was shown in the leaked photo. And it corresponds to Nvidia's internal naming convention for different PCB designs. That detail and the fact some of these entries include 48 gigabytes, and the naming that is, give a little bit of credence to leaker Copite 7 Kimmy's post from July 2022 about a design he dubbed, quote, the beast. So it's a lot to take in, and uh, at least on sort of the rumor side, you get to see a little bit of our process for why do we skip stories sometimes? We eliminate them if we aren't really sure about it. Typically, if we cover something that's a leak or a rumor, it's because we're close enough that we kind of have an idea of what's coming out anyway. But in this instance, uh, it's a very mechanically interesting approach to design. We think there's credibility here given all of these different pieces that you can cobble together. And if it is in fact oriented in the way we're thinking, I really want to test that video card. And I know the team here is ready to do some work on it because uh, there's a lot of really interesting angles from a, a thermal and mechanical sense. Next one, Corsair RMX shift power supplies. These are pretty interesting. So they move the modular power supply uh, cable connection point to the side so that if you ever wanted to add or remove cables from your build after it's built, you're not in there trying to shove your hand into a power supply shroud and unplug a cable you can't see that goes somewhere you also can't see. So Corsair says these will fit in any case that supports an ATX power supply and is at least 210 millimeters wide. The width is very important here. The power supply also has to be accessible from the correct side when mounted. That said, we don't think it would work in the ever popular and the 11D Evo and its derivatives. In that case, the power supply is rotated 90 degrees, which would leave the plugs on top, directly below the hot swap drive cage. Corsair's design also locks you into having the fan down for most cases, but most cases support that orientation anyway, so it's probably not a huge concern. Compatibility concerns aside, the new RMX shift power supplies are ATX 3.0 and PCIe 5.0 certified with both 80 plus 
and Cybernetics Gold ratings for efficiency and electrical characteristics. Another interesting detail with these is that they use Corsair's Type 5 MicroFit connectors on the power supply side, which are smaller than the standard MiniFit. MicroFit is actually the same overall size and pin pitch as what's used on the 12 volt high power 12 plus 4 connector. Our assumption here is that Corsair did this to minimize how far the plugs need to protrude from the side of the power supply so that you don't need a case that is uh, monstrously wide. The downsides here are obvious. Compatibility is the main one. It's worse than standard ATX because it's not completely standard ATX. And even without testing them, that makes it harder to recommend, especially since it's not just going to be plug and play. However, we think this is actually a really cool idea because uh, as long as you know what you're getting into with it, the RMX shift line, from a usability standpoint, in a case where it is usable, would actually be far easier to work with. And certainly if you're the type of person who might add or remove cables over time, that's a valuable feature. If you're more the type of person who builds it and then you don't touch it for four or five years, it's not going to matter for you. But uh, for us, I, we frequently have to connect, disconnect things and systems all the time, basically. And uh, being able to just access it all in basically just a patch panel, more or less, on the side of the computer that's instantly exposed when you pull the panel off, that'd be pretty cool. So these are available and they start at $160 for 850 watts, uh, $270 for 1200 watts. We don't have any plans to do any testing on these specifically right now, but it's an interesting approach. And uh, I guess let us know if you end up getting one. Up next, so last week there was a sad day for Blizzard gamers in China because NetEase, which effectively acted as Blizzard's publisher in China, and Blizzard couldn't come to an agreement on how they wanted their publishing relationship to work. And uh, so long story short, World of Warcraft, Overwatch 2, Starcraft 2, basically any Blizzard game, except for I think it's like Diablo Immortal or something, they, uh, they shut all the servers off. So, I mean, just purely from a gaming standpoint, uh, especially people into MMOs, that's gonna, it's depressing because people put a lot of time into MMOs. They build actual friendships. They form actual groups they play with and talk with. Uh, so that's, it was sad to hear about it. So to catch you up on this, the breakup between the two companies was pretty messy. NetEase has, uh, so NetEase is Simon Ju publicly stated in a LinkedIn post the following. He said, quote, one day when what has happened behind the scene could be told, Developers and gamers will have a whole new level of understanding of how much damage a jerk can make. And it only escalated from there. NetEase ramped it from saying they're jerks and mean to tearing down statues with sledgehammers, Blizzard statues, not just random ones, uh, tore down Blizzard statues with sledgehammers and the now vacant Chinese office campus, which had its own coffee shop on site, had a, a temporary green tea drink that they offered um, in association with this. Now, if you're thinking that that's very nice of them, green tea is good. Uh, green tea in this context, we think just connecting the dots of the Mandarin education I've received is probably related to the slur Lu Cha Biao, which is like, um, it's like someone who acts innocent but is actually extremely manipulative behind the scenes and is sort of preparing to stab you in the back, is my best interpretation of that particular idiom. And if you're native and have a better understanding, feel free to leave it below. But that's how I understand it. So uh, anyway, there's bad blood between the companies. As the day of the shutdown approached, for World of Warcraft at least, uh, Blizzard did make available it, an archival way to store data for profiles, for characters, for accounts, so players could effectively uh, preserve their accounts in the event that Blizzard is able to work with a new publisher, because it sounds like they're not going back at this point, to establish servers once again. Now, players in China started calling this file basically an electronic urn, and the process of creating it they referred to as more or less cremation. Unfortunately for the players, this process locked them out of their accounts entirely. There's videos online of final massive player gatherings as the servers go down, and uh, I mean, if you've ever played an MMO and built connections with people, you can feel for the players in these clips. The only Blizzard game still officially playable in China right now is Diablo Immortal. Not that you should play it, because that one is actually developed by NetEase, and it's operating under a different licensing approach. 
As for why we included it, other than it just being significant, uh, this is a fantastic warning of the future of video games, where basically overnight everything is wiped out and obliterated because f you, you own nothing. So in games where everything is server-based and if game streaming ever takes off, where not only is your data server-based, but all of it is server-based, uh, you, you have no recourse. It's just like it's like it never happened. So uh, that's I don't know. That's a a future we don't really want to see with the total lack of ownership of anything. Certainly, Nvidia is interested in that as well with their streaming services, although it hasn't taken off yet. All right, next one, last one. Discord has a bug where with Nvidia hardware specifically, if you're running Discord in the background, the app. The, there's a chance that the memory clock is reduced by 200 megahertz. So it's not the biggest loss. Memory clocks go pretty high, but that's definitely a decrease in performance. Hopefully this will be addressed with an official update in the near future, but for now, NVIDIA has posted a support article with a workaround. Users can download the GeForce 3D Profile Manager, which is a relic from the SLI era, and then use it to export SLI profiles. And just to be clear, this is even if you have one card. After you have the file exported, you can open it in a text editor, find a Discord in the text, add a specific line, and then save the file. Finally, you use the Profile Manager to import the edited file, which should fix the issue. And credit to the team that figured this out, where they basically took legacy software and they worked their way backwards to solving the problem. Uh, it's a strange problem, given the popularity of Discord and NVIDIA's market share, it may be affecting you without you knowing it. So definitely worth looking into that one and uh, maybe doing the work around if you see the problem. That's it for this one. Thanks for watching. As always, subscribe for more. Go to store.gamersnexus.net to grab a shirt like this one while they're still there or patreon.com slash gamersnexus. We'll see you all next time.